to Andras Eisel to, to give us his own assessment of the Eurogroup meeting as far. To you, Andreas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will give a short overview on actually what, what took uh, place yesterday and then in the end I will give some, some short reflections on this uh, before giving the floor to Lucas, who I think will have some more concrete proposals at hand. So uh, yesterday's Eurogroup meeting um, took place to find a compromise on a number of measures to deal with both the short-term and long-term economic consequences of the, the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, unfortunately, after uh, some lengthy discussions, no final solution was found so far until the early morning hours, which means we will have um, um, Thursday where, where there will be another struggle for compromise. And if not, it will probably go back to the heads of government um, to take over from their finance ministers. Um, there were a number of, of measures and topics discussed yesterday. And so among them were uh, the European Investment Bank's plan of a 200 billion uh, euro fund to provide loans to companies in difficulties, um, the European Commission's plan for a, a temporary European unemployment reinsurance scheme called SURE of up to 100 billion euros of loans um, to support especially national short-term working schemes. Um, and I think there's uh, some rather broad consensus on, on these two measures. And then there were some, some other issues that are still a bit um, less concrete or that are more uh, hardly, hard, strongly fought over. And so um, there has been a lot of exchange actually about the, the future role of the EU budget in dealing with some of the issues uh, of the economic crisis, providing assistance to member states. And I think that's pretty important uh, also because there's the ongoing negotiations for the next multiannual financial framework. Um, and then uh, two key issues were, of course, um, the, the, the question of providing loans through the European stability mechanisms um, of up to 2% of, of a country's GDP through a new uh, type of credit line. And there, the, the huge discussion is with, kind of con with, which, with which kind of conditionality is this coming with little, no, or actually some, some considerable sort of conditionality. Um, and there's also been a very strong uh, discussion, uh, vivid discussion about the creation of an instrument, maybe called Corona Bonds, Recovery Fund, or, or whatsoever, um, that would at least on a temporary basis provide some, some common debt issuance, um, and that would, would be based on grants rather than loans given to member states, and, and in the end would, would uh, contain some form of transfers um, between member states. And, I mean, a bit as expected, there's been a major class, a clash, especially between Italy and the Netherlands, which are in a sense representing um, the positions of a more northern and more southern block of countries. I mean, behind Netherlands, you have countries such as Austria and Finland, to a certain extent, Germany, um, and behind Italy, you have countries such as Spain, Portugal, and to a certain extent, France. And so um, the big issues yesterday discussed were the Netherlands demanded actually that there would be rather strong conditionality um, attached to ESM loans um, to support national economies. Only for health expenditures, um, they, they would have seen an exemption from, from any conditionality. And the Netherlands is also very strongly rejecting any calls for, for common debt. Um, in their view, which would simply increase risk in Europe instead of reducing them, I think, which is, which is pretty questionable, but that's the, that's the position they, they have for the moment. And Italy, on the other hand, um, uh, is very strongly against any or strong conditionality attached to ESM loans um, and also strongly supports the introduction of some form of, of common debt, um, um, rather arguing that there's risk sharing needed um, in Europe. I mean, some of these concerns are also strongly driven by, yeah, by domestic concerns. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, there will be elections uh, next year, which will be probably a contest between current Prime Minister Mark Rutte and Finance Minister which is from another party from the Christian Democrats, Wilke Höchsta. And in, in Italy, actually, the ESM is also a big issue because um, there's already been this, this, this dilemma that there's a, um, a lack of solidarity perceived um, of uh, European of Eurozone member states from the last crisis. And the ESM itself is rather seen as a, as a tool uh, of overt intrusion to national domestic affairs, actually. And that risk, actually, even if there's a compromise found on the ESM, um, that, that Italy, as long as uh, bond interest rates don't go up strongly, actually might even refuse to use this, um, as this is a, a strongly uh, contested domestic issue. Um, just a, a side note, what I think is interesting also in terms of solidarity, um, um, I think the, um, 
there there has been there has been some some switch from the last crisis where where, where transfers were seen as something not possible and actually the, the Dutch themselves made a proposal for some some kind of transfer actually which would not be linked to any form of common debt issuance and this has actually also been picked up by some some German economists that saying well there's kind of a, a crisis solidarity a short term solidarity maybe you can call it like this. Um, um, so I think um, what is important for this, and so now moving to some of my some of my initial um, remarks to to this evolution is, um, I think uh, it's it's interesting that even countries that have been so far a bit reluctant to provide fiscal transfers, and this is always a huge issue um, on the in the eurozone uh, level, they seem to be more willing than in the last crisis to display some solidarity. What I think is important, though, I think really important that it doesn't only matter that there is or there will be solidarity, but also in which, which form and which extent this solidarity takes. And I think uh, a big struggle will, about this and will be about this. And um, there is now a lot of proposals uh, on the table for some sort of common debt uh, issuance. Um, and while there is a lot of confusion because a lot of people call, give the same name to instruments or tools that are actually very different, um, or on the other hand, call things that are actually very similar in the outcome very differently. Um, and however you want to call these 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 instruments, I, I think what will be important in the way forward is to actually um, have some common debt issuance, um, at least on a temporary basis, and which will actually serve to provide some some transfers across eurozone member states. And so this should become basically in the form of grants or subsidies rather than um, loans. And I think. Um, this is important because from, from my point of view, I work a lot on, on, on fiscal policy and fiscal rules, fiscal frameworks. Um, it's because the exclusive use of loans will just strongly increase the indebtedness of individual Eurozone member states. Um, also of those, of course, that were already very burdened with high debt before the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I think that such a strong increase of deficits and debt will pose However, major problems for certain member states as soon as there will be pressure again from the Commission and other member states to re revoke the escape clause, which at least for now, for the time being, has suspended parts of the European fiscal framework, basically. Um, and so already before the crisis has hit um, Europe, actually, there have been some major difficulties for, for some countries with the fiscal rules. I mean, Italy already had big problems to, for example, to, to comply with, with, the, with the debt re requirements, basically, and even a small reduction in debt has been difficult due to, to low growth, mainly. Um, and um, if most of the additional debt will then, with that stem from the crisis, will be nationally, this will be, I think, it actually create extreme pressures on the European fiscal framework itself. And from this point of view, it might be actually in the interest, even of uh, the more northern Eurozone member states, um, to, to jointly finance new public debt through common debt issuance if they actually want to go back, and I think that's their interest mainly, to the existing set of fiscal rules. I mean, there will be a trade-off uh, in terms of how the, the debt will be financed that is, is necessary to be, to be made right now to deal with the consequences of the crisis and um, which kind of framework should be placed on the European level. Um, but I'll leave it there for the moment and uh, give over to Lucas. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Andreas, um, and thanks a lot, uh, Sebastian, for having me in this in this webinar. I would like to make three points, um, building up on, on what Andreas uh, said so far. I think the first observation I would have is that uh, things are moving finally, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, we had two Eurogroup meetings, which were uh, fairly superficial, with long statements uh, where there were actually no decisions. We also had the European Council two weeks ago, um, which also failed to take any meaningful decisions and um, didn't even give a, a good mandate to member states and, and to the ministers in the Eurogroup. And so I think now the, the important issues are really on the table and that's very helpful. And I think now we are discussing the important, the important measures. Um, the interesting thing about last night, I think it was also that um, we did apparently have fairly broad agreement on these three measures that Andreas mentioned and that in a way the Netherlands were a bit the odd one out um, and that we didn't have really the, the traditional country groupings. I think it depended a bit on the on the different measures but especially on the, the question whether the ESM could give out loans without conditionality 
um, the Dutch seemed fairly, fairly isolated. And I found it quite remarkable that Olaf Scholz, the German finance minister, in his press statement this, this morning was very clear that he's, he used the formulation, we are almost there, but we require unanimity. And that's a strong a public statement I've heard a, a German finance minister give against his Dutch colleague, um, as I remember, in, in like recent years. Um, and what is also important, I think, is and uh, that also was very remarkable in, in Scholz's statement this morning is the um, the realization that we need to go beyond these three measures, so EIB, ESM, and the Commission's sure proposal, um, and have something for the recovery phase. Um, this is a, it was a French proposal, this reco the recovery fund, and this acceptance that this package of three measures is not enough, I think, is also very significant. Um, second point I want to make. Um, and that is a bit more conceptual. I think we have to make sure that we always understand that we have two distinct problems that we need to tackle. One is, or like in general, when we talk about member states' capacity to fight the, the fallout of this crisis with fiscal, the fiscal measures, the first problem we have is financing conditions. Member states need access to credit um, at reasonable terms. And that is something the ECB with its PEP program has largely taken care of. Um, and that the ESM program that is, or like the ESM credit line that is now proposed, and also, by the way, the Commission's sure proposal, um, help um, to add a second and third line of defense for the financing conditions of member states and markets. That's a very important problem, but I would say now that has largely been solved. We have a different problem which is that some member states enter this, this crisis with much higher debt levels than others. Um, and also with, um, for some countries, um, a weaker growth potential. Um, and for these countries, it's not only about financing conditions, um, but to ensure like a long-term sustainability of their debt, even with the new fiscal measures that, that, that all will have to take, we will need some form of burden sharing of the costs, which in plain English means they might not have to pay everything back that they are spending now. Um, and for this kind of problem, we do not really have a solution yet. Um, and I think it's very important also when we, we talk about different instruments like Corona bonds, like a fund, like uh, using the ESM, that we are very clear what, what, which of the two problems we try to address and that we basically need political agreement on two principles at the European level, on the principle that all member states need to have reasonable financing conditions, and on the principle that we need to share the burden of the fiscal cost of this crisis. And I don't think we are there yet for the second one. Um, third point I want to make linked to that is that um, I want to briefly discuss what Sebastian Grun, Christian Odendahl and I have proposed um, on the weekend as a solution to the second problem, um, which is the burden sharing. Um, what we've proposed is to set up um, what we call a pandemic solidarity instrument, so an EU instrument under Article 122 of the treaty, um, which would be really tailored to this crisis, which would be time bound, so temporary um, with a specific target um, where the commission would issue bonds in the market. We think about uh, 440 billion euros, and would then, with this money, co-finance uh, different measures in member state and prop up the EIB. The measures by the, uh, the member states would be um, short-term work schemes, um, directly health-related spending, and then also co-financing of stimulus packages when they, when they come due. You could call these corona bonds or not. I don't think that's very important. Um, but the important thing is we believe that we need some form of common debt issuance because the alternative would be to increase the EU budget massively and to do this kind of co-financing of member states measures um, from the EU level to the EU budget. But I don't think in, this con in these economic conditions it, is, um, reason it can be reasonably expected that any of the member states will put substantially higher um, contributions on the table already this year. And that is why we propose this kind of common debt issuance, not as an end in itself, but as a means to finance um, a European contribution to national fiscal efforts that then has to be repaid um, much later and that it doesn't have to be financed this year. So I think um, these three points are important. A, there's movement. B, we have two different problems and we don't have a solution to the second one, which is burden sharing yet. Um, but at least there's, there seems to be an opening now. And third, 
um, there are some, there we need new instruments, we need new solutions, but these are possible within the EU framework. They can be deployed fairly quickly. Um, and if you want to check it out, it's on our website at the law center .eu. And I think I hand over to Eulalia now, no? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't have the micro open. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you, Andreas and Lucas. I will try to, to complement what they have been saying. Uh, we, I will focus more on the EU budget. Actually, one of the themes that we see in this EU group is that there has been quite a lot of discussion on the EU budget. And that's something that is not, uh, it's, it's rare in the Euro groups, actually. Normally, Euro groups do not deal with the MFF. But now it's true that it has come up this idea that the, since we are starting to negotiate the new uh, MFF, maybe that can be part of a, you know, the centerpiece of a new Marshall Plan for the recovery. So, so I would like to make two points on that, maybe. Just before talking about that, saying that, of course, we have seen that the, in the EU budget has already been mobilized in response to the crisis, but we know the limits of the EU budget. Uh, we know that uh, there, there are not a lot of margins. So the Commission has proposed the coronavirus facility investment, coronavirus investment facility uh, to use the, the, the cohesion funds and this new emergency support instrument, but it's always very tiny. So we cannot do much uh, with, the, with the current EU budget. And the question now is what we can do with the new MFF, whether we can use it. And we know that uh, von der Leyen, Ursula von der Leyen proposed uh, announced some, some days ago uh, that they are going to reform, to review the proposal of MFF. And as I say, I wanted to do two main points, one on content and the other on timing. On content, um, I would say that it's very important not to, not to have very high expectations on that. Uh, uh, of course, as Lucas has said, uh, from a formal or from a logical perspective, the best solution would be to do it through the EU budget, but we know uh, what is the dynamics of negotiation on the EU budget. And, uh, I don't think the crisis will change that much. Uh, there will be still the dominance of net balances uh, in, in the negotiations. And if something, the crisis can aggravate this, the more we take, the more time we take to adopt the new MFF, the more the crisis have been, will, be, will be unfold and the more uh, the difficulties or the, or the resistance of member states to lose in net balances, either net contributors or net beneficiaries. So that does not mean that, uh, that that means that I don't expect and I don't think the Commission has the capacity to do a major change in terms of size or in terms of reallocation of the spending because reallocating a spending across headings means changing net balances among member states. So that means reopening the discussion again. But that doesn't mean that nothing can be done. And of course, it's normal to try to adjust the new MFF to the situation. I see two or three, four things that can be done, and I think and expect the Commission to put on the table. Uh, one, I, th I expect they will uh, they will uh, exploit much more the possibility to build up instruments on the budget, leveraging additional funding, meaning through debt, meaning through guarantees, uh, and this has already been done uh, in the past. Uh, it has been experimented much more late, uh, lately with the with EPSI, which was uh, in itself an innovation, the Juncker Fund. And we can always have this possibility. We can always have an MFF with a margin without the on, on resource selling that allows us to create, if there is political consensus, to create something based on that. Of course, it will not be the bazooka we need. And as Lucas has said, this has to be based on national, on national um, budgets, but it can help and it can be a complement. Uh, the other thing related with this, uh, and, and the, that it's important, is to increase the armed resource ceiling. We know that the Commission uh, proposed already an increase to the armed resource ceiling uh, in the previous uh, MFF proposal, and uh, it had been uh, diminished by the Council. The, the armed resource ceiling, to, to, to repeat, this is just the, the, the maximum capacity the Commission has to ask for revenues to fill the obligations, to, to, to reimburse the obligations linked to the EU budget. That does not mean that we are going to spend it all, but that gives uh, margin for the Commission to create new instruments. Um, third thing, and that's very important, also flexibility. I think, I think that's essential. So if once, one thing we can uh, learn from this crisis is that we can no longer work in a seven-year budget totally with, uh, with a totally frozen expenditures, and especially now that we have this uncertainty uh, on, the, on the next year. So, uh, there are many ways of introducing flexibility, and the, the Council has always been very reluctant to put more flexibility to the budget, but I think there you have some margins to, to, 
to see changes in position of the country, much more than on size, much more than on major reallocation of spending. Some things it can be done is at least at very minimum least to reintroduce the midterm review that was one proposal of the commission endorsed also for by the parliament but the council refused to do it i think we really need this time a measure and real midterm review we cannot we cannot uh, plan uh, the next seven years we need to separate maybe the the, one, the first second year which will be much more based on on, on confronting the crisis and the the, le the last years of the mff which, which will be much more Getting out of the crisis and and, uh, and uh, recovery and and and, re and and recovery and retaking the the priorities of before climate uh, this kind of things uh, and then we can also introduce much more flexibility within the programs and we have seen now for instance the commission has just presented um, has given a lot of flexibility in the use of EU funding uh, if you EU cohesion funding for this year why not maintaining this for the following year so that member states has have much more capacity to use EU cohesion funding to, to, to fight this crisis. Another thing that is easy to, relatively easy to do is to front load spending without changing national envelopes, just putting much more spending first years and not the last years. So these kind of things you can do it, and I think it's good that the Commission put this on the table. The other thing is on procedure or on timing. Uh, the problem we have now, and as we all know, is that time, uh, we don't have time, time is, time is running. We were already out of time to approve the next MFF. Uh, in February, March, uh, Mr. Kuman, the, the Director General, was saying to us that, um, uh, I mean, if, if we don't agree to an MFF at the end of the year, there is this question of we should put into place a contingency plan to allow uh, the ceilings of the current uh, MFF to be extended for one year. And that, that's a procedure that is a bit complex because you need also to extend all the legal basis of all the programs so as to to give the Commission the, the authorization to continue spending with these programs. So the Commission was saying uh, some months ago that that was very complicated, but was saying that nevertheless, if there was no agreement on MFF before the summer, they would put a proposal to, of contingency plan. Now, if we put this new uh, MFF proposal on the table um, late in April, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that there will be uh, an MFF agreement in the Council before the summer. So I think the Commission should not. Uh, of course, they bet on the uh, on the on the possibility on, on this on this scenario that the Council under crisis they will reach an agreement and the Parliament will endorse an agreement. But I, I would say you, we should not be so optimistic, and especially we should be sure we, we we should guarantee that there will be an option in case of no deal because the worst the worst thing it could happen. Uh, in terms of EU budget for Italy and Spain, for instance, is to have problems to spend in 2021 uh, and to lose EU funding that they have, uh, they, they receive annually. So let's let's do both things at the same time. Let's try to negotiate a new MFA, but do not forget and do not do not underestimate the the complications uh, if there is no deal and prepare for the worst because it's important to have this safety net in case there is no agreement on the on the MFA. So I leave it here and then uh, we can. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Lalia. As you mentioned, time is running and it's almost three o'clock, so we'll, we'll uh, I think, move on with our, our question and um, answer session. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Andreas, Lucas, uh, and yourself, Lalia, for uh, both uh, giving us your um, analysis of the Eurogroup as it stands now and also hinting to some uh, realistic solutions that are on the table and that uh, we are, I would be happy to, to discuss. I leave now the floor to Mathieu Meunier, who has uh, received, I think, uh, some, uh, some questions and who will uh, then uh, uh, manage uh, this uh, part of the second part of this webinar. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, you have the opportunity in the question and answer um, button situated in the bottom toolbar to ask your questions. And I will then forward them to, <coughs> to our speakers. Uh, you also have the opportunity to, to vote for previously submitted questions. Um, so that will contribute to, to um, singling out the questions you find, you find the most important. Uh, as we have no questions for the moment, maybe Lucas or Andreas, would you like to react to to what Eulalia said, or or um... maybe I can I can say one one thing on on Eulalia's point. I, I I absolutely share the view that we 
should try to use the EU budget as much as possible um, to, to complement the efforts that are discussed now in the Eurogroup. But I think one, there, there's one danger in putting too much emphasis on the MFF, which is that, and I think we have seen that already like in statements by the Commission President in the recent weeks, that there shouldn't be the impression that only with the MFF we can do the burden sharing that we need. Unless one thinks that, as I said, we get massively increased contributions by member states, which I don't believe. Um, but I think there is a certain danger in uh, suppressing political momentum by saying, look, the MFF will be, will be our Marshall Plan for Europe, and, and this will be the solution to our problems, and therefore we don't need new instruments that go further. Um, and we know that the Commission has been very skillful in, the, in recent years to produce very high numbers in the context of the EU budget and the MFF uh, with very little actual money behind it, um, either through guarantees, and we can discuss whether guarantees are a, real, a good instrument in a situation where we will likely see losses on certain projects, um, but um, where basically you create this impression that everything is fine until it isn't anymore. And so I think there is a, there is a strategic element to the, the MFF um, debate that, that shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah, yeah, I, I, mean, I totally agree. I, I think, I think that would, uh, anyway, that one, one thing that distinguishes uh, what we see now in this crisis from the last Eurozone crisis is that uh, we have put the EU budget in the picture, and that's not so bad. And I totally agree, it cannot be the centerpiece of one uh, uh, EU solution. But we should also remember what were the criticisms we did to the Eurozone uh, mechanisms that we built up during the Eurozone crisis that were very much, and we have seen the, the consequences of that, that, that were entirely intergovernmental and it was very difficult to mobilize them or to activate them because they were always submitted to unanimity. So uh, I think there's some scope to, 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 do, to, to do combinations between the EU budget and, for instance, putting guarantees of member states, but always within the EU the EU framework and always with the Commission on the on, on the wheel on you know controlling this, because having it into the EU budget has some benefits. First, it, it, it maintains the unity, and then it also ensures that it is under also the Parliament participates a bit. So I think, of course, it will not be uh, the budget that will provide all the funding. But if we can try to combine with introducing, for instance, uh, a mechanism which we merge guarantees from member states with EU budget. Uh, Resources. That's a way of, of putting something unified and, and simply, you know, single instrument and not having separate things. Very tiny EU budget instrument that it was the case with the European stability uh, financial stability mechanism and the European facility uh, financial stability facility. I think it's better if we try if we can try to do something uh, a sort of single instrument. Now I don't know if technically it can be done, but I think they, they, they can try to do something like this. And, and it would be good to try to, create, at least to avoid having something totally parallel and outside the, 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 the framework, because we know that once we create this, and it's what it has happened with ESM, it will never get into it. And we know it, even, even if they commit to do it in five, seven years, it will never get it. That, 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 that gets permanent outside of the EU framework. And that's, I think, but of course, uh, having said so, I don't want to. I want to see that now the urgency is having an agreement to having something. So if the only way of having an agreement is having it to something intergovernmental out of the budget, that's better than nothing. But for me, it's if if we can merge both things, that would be better. Uh, so we have a, a first uh, a first question. So. Um from an anonymous spectator, what is the role of the European Central Bank quantitative easing if common burden sharing is agreed upon? I think maybe, Lucas, you would like to answer this question. Yeah, I can take this one and I can also take the next one on the possibility, like there's a question on whether there should be bonds, uh, like a member states should be issue, should issue very long term bonds of 100 years or perpetual to be bought by the ECB and the, and the QE. Um, so the first thing I think burn sharing would help a lot because it would um, basically give political backing to the ECB to buy a lot more of the of, of this debt. We know on the current rules that the ECB can buy supranational debt, so ESM, EIB, um, commission debt up to 50% of issuance and issuer, um, which is dif different from um, 
the um, limits that we have under QE at least um, for national debt. And the reason for this is of course because um, buying a supranational debt does not run into the same concerns regarding monetary financing and also um, restructure, uh, like potential restructuring than um, uh, the, the national member state debt. Um, so I think it would, like having some kind of burden sharing with some form of common issuance would help the ECB doing its job on the monetary policy side. Um, the other question on like the member states issuing long-term bonds that would be like 100 year or perpetual and uh, the last part of the question already answers it in a way that would be monetary financing and to put my German hat on for a moment, um, there is article one to three of the treaty which prohibits monetary financing. It has um, like very stretchable limits as the, the ECJ has already said when, when it uh, issued its judgment on QE, but there are limits. And taking a 100 year or perpetual bond on the books of individual member states would pretty, pretty um, likely uh, not fall or not be okay under, uh, under the treaty. Uh, our next question is uh, possibly a more general one for the European Union. So, do you think the handling of this crisis is a form of turning point for the European Union? If the crisis isn't handled on the European level, I fear there will be an increase in the already existing scepticism towards the EU. Yeah, I, I think I can I can take this one. I mean, um, as often has been said, I mean, uh, things are, are made or are broken uh, during crisis. And so, of course, this is um, a major turning point for the European Union. I think what's interesting is, I mean, in a certain sense, this is an unprecedented crisis. So, I mean, even even to compare it with 2009 and what happened shortly afterwards is is probably we see a, a deeper crisis now going on. Um, what, is, what is good, I think, is that there are some tools in place now um, to, to overcome this crisis, which were very painfully developed and had to be fought through um, during the last crisis. I mean, um, just that the ECB basically made this very early decision or basically showed resolve in, in being uh, basically refinancing um, states if necessary and, and, and doing this um, um, was way quicker than in, in the previous crisis and so this helped but I think as the crisis is, um, is a very deep one I think this will challenge very much the, this whole notion of solidarity especially as this crisis I think you can really argue is, is not the fault of any individual countries and um, so the, the lucky ones um, that are hit less are are really in for helping the other ones. And I mean, if the if the European Union is really, as some people say, not just then an economic project, but is also a political and a social project, um, solidarity is needed. But what I what I already said before, I think it's very important um, that there is solidarity also felt. Is that this need to take a, a certain a certain form also, and that this is able to um, actually create in the long in the long run. Um, uh, actually stronger potential economic growth. Um, I mean, we have seen some countries that had some, some very low um, growth rates before the, this crisis. And I mean, whatever will come now in the re recovery plan um, set out on the European level um, will determine if, if the European Union and its member states will be further fragmented afterwards or if there is actually a joint resolve and, and a joint push towards a stimulus that would actually also help the, those countries that went into the crisis in a weaker position. Um, if, if, this, um, if some form some of real solidarity or of, of a strong reaction is, is not happening, then, then I fear also that this will, will strongly push forward Eurosceptic forces, nationalistic forces, and so forth. And I, I think it's very important that there is a decisive reaction on the European level and that member states, especially those that are in a better position, are understanding what the long-term consequences will be if there will be no decisive actions and that it's good to take decisive actions the sooner the better. And especially on issues just as, such as common debt issuance, the sooner you do this, the more you will also help um, national member states to not run into overly high individual uh, uh, public debt, basically, and I think in the long run, that's uh, something that will, will be helpful um, for the Eurozone and Europe um, uh, as a whole. And so that uh, brings us to another question we got on, uh, on the question of, uh, of growth. 
what will the long-term impacts of the inevitable increased sovereign debt issuance that we will see be on the growth in the EU? Surely countries like France and Italy adding to their debt now will mean austerity in the coming years, which will depress growth in the EU as a whole. Therefore, it must be in the interest of countries like the Netherlands or Austria that their ma major trading partners emerge from this crisis in a position to buy their goods and services. Is there any reaction to the statement? Yeah, I think it's pretty much in line to, to what I said before. So, I mean, espe especially for those countries that already um, had difficulties in, in increasing their potential growth, basically, um, if you if we are not doing anything about this, then then there will be a further fragmentation in the years to come. And those countries that were doing already better before will most likely do better, and those that already were struggling will most likely struggle even more. And that what's always important when you think about um, public debt is um, <clears throat> it also depends on I mean the size of your public debt to GDP, as it's typically nevertheless counted, depends also on the growth of your economy. And there is a, always a potential to grow out of debt. And uh, I think there needs to be a lot of effort put into this direction, um, especially towards forward-looking uh, uh, investment, basically, to allow um, all countries, I think, but especially those that, that suffered from, 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 from low growth rates before to be able to increase that. And that will help them even if we have now strongly increased um, uh, public debt to overcome these problems without going into overt austerity. And what I think is important, what I think what we, what we could have learned from or what we should have learned from the last crisis is that while in 2009, um, there has been some substantial stimulus uh, into the economy. Then, then actually very rapidly there was uh, fiscal consolidation taking place. And that was also due to pressure from the markets, of course, which then until 2012 were not, were not really resolved. Um, but, uh, but consolidation took, took probably uh, place uh, too rapidly, basically, which undermined um, and the, the post-crisis growth, basically. And I think what is will be very important for any recovery plan now is not uh, just a stop short of, of dealing with the short-term consequences of the crisis, which are extremely strong and sharp, but also think about this will have a strong impact on, on future uh, growth, basically, and we need a, a sufficient stimulus and um, for a sufficiently long time to, to get over it, basically. Yeah. And I think that's very much in the interest um, of, of, of countries uh, like Germany or the Netherlands and um, and Austria. I mean, we're economically in interdependent and uh, you can only for so long um, basically um, uh, profit inside a common currency. So. Uh, so the next question is very much about the ongoing negotiations. So uh, one viewer is asking, could you clarify, could you clarify the, pos the position of Germany on Eurobonds or other burden sharing solutions compared to the position of the Netherlands? Um, maybe I can take that one. Um, so I don't think there's a set position on the question of common issuance. So, um, so far the government hasn't said anything that it would support any form of common issuance. There's the head of the SPD, um, Norbert Walter Boyans, being on record for the need for some form of common issuance. Um, the, the CDU, the bigger coalition partner so far, has um, ruled that out. Um, but I think also one of the problems we have in the German debate is that we are very much in a Eurobond versus non -Euro, no Eurobond um, discussion. And that, of course, is not the alternatives we are really talking about. So I think it would, it would also take a bit of time to really um, get into a more nuanced debate about the, the necessary instruments. I think one thing that is clear in the German debate is that plain vanilla euro bonds where we like we issue bonds um, on behalf of member states so that they can uh, take the money into their budgets will not happen um, that is like the i think there's also a pretty clear legal constraint in both the german constitution and also the eu treaties and so i think the position on euro bonds euro bonds on the german side is the same as the dutch one on burden sharing as said Scholz this morning basically endorsed the, the French idea of a recovery fund and on the need to do something more um, beyond these three measures um, that were discussed. So I would be there cautiously optimistic that at least things will be moving. And also remember five weeks ago, the Germans had the Schwarze Null and um, 
that fell within uh, like a few days. Um, so I wouldn't like too much internalize German red lines at this point as they might be um, more moving than we think. Just a side note um, for one of the other northern countries. So I mean, Austria is also officially very strongly opposed to what was the, the Corona bond um, proposal. So especially Chancellor uh, Sebastian Kurz, but also the, the, the finance minister, Gernot Blümer. But their coalition partner, the Green Party, um, signaled and the, the vice chancellor and head of the Green Party, who is actually a, a, an economist, he um, at least kind of floated the, the, the possibility that corona bonds could be something that would be, uh, re would be possible under a number of conditions, of course. Uh, but um, so concerning Austria, for example, which is part of this, this Northern Bloc, there's also maybe a bit of a, a change in the air. I mean, of course, they are, the, the official position is still to be strongly opposed, but I think it's considerably less so than then in the Netherlands, where, um, as I, I laid out before, there's also this, this domestic contest for the, for the next elections to be, yeah, the, the, who has the strongest position, basically, um, on this issue. Okay, thank you. The, the next question is about the EU budget, so it will be a question for Eulalia. What do you think of the proposal of published, published on Italian newspaper by economist Gro to allow MS to be relieved from paying into the EU budget? For an, a member state like Italy, it means saving up to 100 billion euros. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know the proposal. Uh, actually, what Daniel Ross proposed is to relieve uh, Italy and Spain from the from payment of net contribu uh, national contributions to the EU budget in the following seven years. And indeed, there is a big, that, that would be a big, uh, a big amount of money to, to be spared. The problem, I see two or three problems with this proposal. One is that, uh, that assumes that the crisis will only touch these two big countries. And now we are in, a, in the middle of uncertainty. We don't know where, whether it will be stopped or not. Otherwise, if it, if it spreads to other countries, that's very difficult. Someone has to pay for the budget. The, the, the part that Italy and Spain do not put on the budget has to be compensated by extra, by extra national contributions from the other EU budget. And the, the advantage of using debt instruments, the advantage of using uh, Corona bonds or whatever we want to talk, uh, to, to use the name, uh, whatever we want to, to call them, is that we are using two things. We are resharing between member states, but also between years in some sense, in temporally. So we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are putting ahead in the time the payment of the cost that we have now. Uh, now, saying that in, this, in the next seven years, some member states will have to pay more to the EU budget, even if they are not suffering as Italy and Spain, they are suffering also. It's very difficult. So economically, it seems to me that doesn't make sense because we don't know the spread of the crisis. And politically, it will be also very difficult because we need to change the own resource decision for that. And the own resource decision has to be approved by unanimity and ratified by all national parliaments. So I, I, I think it's, it's not a solution actually because it's, not, it's difficult and it's economically a bit questionable that it would work actually. Uh, so, so our uh, auditor Pierre Jaillet is uh, asking, could you come back on the kind of conditionality that might be attached to ESM financing and what could be the room of maneuver in further discussion, in further discussions? So that question, could you come back to the kind of uh, condition? Or so basically, I mean, there's the, the ECCL, the Enhanced Condition Credit Line, or like some new ESM credit line that would be set up. Um, and I think the idea is here to say, basically do whatever you need to do um, to combat the, the pandemic. Um, and that is enough in terms of conditions. Um, and that, I would say that's possible under the, under the current ESM treaty. Um, but ultimately, that's a political problem at the moment. I think it's fairly binary. Like the Dutch say, you can now, as, as Andreas already said, you can now get the money without conditions now, but you will have to abide by some conditions after the, um, after the pandemic ha has, has ceased. Um, and that's just completely politically unrealistic in Italy. So um, my assumption would be that at some point, like the Dutch will have to make a judgment call whether or not um, to 
to fall in line in a way. Maybe there are concessions on other points, but I think on that on that point is it's fairly binary. And uh, an important consideration there is also this is pretty symbolic because the likelihood that somebody goes to the ASM, even Italy in that situation, is very, very low. Plus, if we have this sure proposal by the Commission, which is basically the same as the ESM, um, just with less conditions attached to it, if you get loans that you have to pay back, um, is more attractive than the ESM. So um, the likelihood that this like ESM credit line will ever be used as low, and when it should be used, then it will be too small. So then we talk about different conditions in any case. So this is like a largely political symbolic fight because some countries like Germany and the Netherlands were very adamant that the ESM is the right tool to be used. So there needs to be an ESM tool in the box. Um, and the Italians were very adamant that it doesn't have to, uh, it can't come with any conditionality. But the practical implication of that decision, I would say, is pretty low. It's a political and symbolic question. Uh, so the following question is uh, also on the European Central Bank. So in substance, the European Central Bank is already doing monetary financing, like all the central banks, even though nobody wants to say it. Without monetary fi financing of the current measures, austerity in the future will depress Europe. So the point is why not simply keeping on with purchases, which are compliant with Article 123, with longer term maturities which would be as legitimate as current purchases. Yeah, again, like monetary, the monetary financing prohibition is not just a binary thing where it says you cannot do monetary financing if certain forms that would be characterized as monetary financing are allowed, others are automatically allowed as well. There is a clear, um, now with two, two cases, um, a clear case law at the European Court of Justice which says what kind of bond purchases of member states gov um, uh, government bonds are permitted and which ones are not. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, but um, doing something with a perpetual bond that stays on the ECB balance sheet forever, under the, these judgments are very likely not to be legal, whereas QE that is happening at the moment is clearly legal under um, ECJ case law. Um, and so I think it's important to, run, to, to keep that in mind, like the ECB is not uh, like a UFO that does whatever it wants, but it is governed by EU law and that law input puts limits on what the ECB can do. Uh, so I see there's no further questions, but maybe as a form of a free conclusion, I could ask you what, what do you think, what do you expect will happen uh, tomorrow afternoon in, in the further meeting of the Eurogroup? Maybe as a quick, uh, quick conclusion. Uh, as I started, I mean, I can, I can start again. So, I mean, it, that's always very uncertain because um, some of the decisions uh, depend then on some, some kind of deals that are, are on, on other issues. I mean, as I said um, in the beginning, I, I think uh, the, the Netherlands with taking this very strong position of there has to be some yeah, rather strong conditionality in the ESM was, was kind of a, a leverage um, to, to basically then say, okay, we will cave in on this, but we will not cave in on, on any form of, um, of common debt issuance uh, and, and so forth. So I think that the likelihood that there, that, um, there will be actually some solution for the, the ESM basically where maybe the, the, the Netherlands will step back is, is not that low. I mean, especially as, as the, for quite some time, the, this, this was proposed as, a, as the mean tool as solution. While before it was rather, it was either we will have the ESM or something completely different. And now it's already like this will have, and then we'll have something com complementary. Uh, I think it will be, it's hard to, to see now what, what the exact compromise will be. I think there could be some compromise on some tool that will actually kind of function like common debt issuance, but will be very technical, very complicated, um, so that it might be sellable um, somehow to uh, the, the public audiences in, in specific member states. Um, well, I would, I would, I would find good that they find it good that there would be some, some, some way forward there. I, I think there's nevertheless a risk uh, 
at least for now, this will be rather in in some very um, in, in a language that is uh, not very binding um, until until maybe later. And I mean, uh, as as this crisis will unfold, I, I think it's pretty it's pretty certain that there will be some more some stronger forms of solidarity needed because the, the ESM, I mean, in, in terms of, of what you consider conciliatarity is a, a rather a weak tool in the end. And um, as Lucas also said, I mean, this is mainly for liquidity support. And as long as the, the ECB is actually can, can help actually to keep down interest rates, there's actually not that much, I think, rather little interest even for countries like Italy to, to use this. And also because this is a very um, red flag um, and domestically. Um, so I think that's a bit uh, what I would see is the direction going. And I mean, if, if there's still no, com no solution found, I think there will be some solution found over the next days, maybe on the, on the level of the um, heads of government, basically, maybe not on the finance minister level. Yeah. Mm, maybe I continue and then Olalia, if you can have the last, the last word, if that's okay. Um, I would I would build on I would build on on what Andres just said. Um, I think it's I would say it's relatively likely, but who knows that we get some like agreement on the ESM tomorrow? Um, my assumption would be that at least at the leaders level, we get some package that has some of these elements. If if not, then we we are in real trouble because if we, if we can't agree even on that, then I. I think we have a problem on agreeing on, on the important principles. Um, nevertheless, I think the next European Council will be important because I don't see the Eurogroup doing anything beyond the three measures, but just an opening on this recovery fund um, idea and, and an openness or like a signal to the leaders give us more guidance on where we should work on. And I think we are at a point where this ping pong between the Eurogroup and the European Council should stop. And the European Council needs to make needs to make up its mind like how much political capital are the leaders um, ready to invest into the, the economic response to this crisis. And that means tasking finance ministers clearly with working on something that goes beyond liquidity provision and into burden sharing. Um, because that's so political that finance ministers will not be able to work without on their own without clear political guidance. So I think tomorrow is important in a way to provide the necessary condition for further progress, but it's by no means a sufficient condition. The sufficient condition has to come next, next week with the European Council and with a clear political commitment by leaders to go further than what we already have in the toolbox. Yeah, maybe we can, I can add to this. Um, I, I could say what I don't want to see, actually. I, I totally agree with Andreas and Lucas, and uh, uh, my fear is that seeing, uh, of course, we, we more or less uh, hint that there will be these three measures uh, with green light, more or less. But then the, the big question is what will happen with this four one, no? the recovery fund or whatever we want to call it. And what I don't want to see is to see this directly linked to MFF negotiations, because for me, it would be a way of kicking the can down and not doing anything. And, uh, and, and, and uh, delaying a lot the decision to be taken, a bit, and a bit to, to, to take the burden out of the Eurogroup and saying, well, that's the commission who has to make a proposal and then we'll see. And no, I mean, as Lucas has said, the EU budget, and I, and I repeat the, 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 the point I did before, I think the EU budget would be good to be part of the solution, but it's not the main part, it's not the centerpiece. So what we need, first of all, is the political will of, of, of sharing, with sharing, uh, burden sharing, among member states, and then if we can put into the EU budget and plus he, giving the, the, the authority of the Commission to control or to manage this instrument, that's that's perfect. But do not link too much this to the MFF negotiation because this is this is really a way of saying we are not going to do anything until uh, May, uh, and we don't have a, as, I mean we don't have all this time, or even after the summer. And we know that MFF negotiations take a lot of time. So, so for me, to, to simplify it, I, I think I would like to see the opening to a European, European Council decision on that. And then the EU budget, of course, giving, giving margins to the EU budget to give the space to complement this, 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 this recovery fund, but not, not, not expecting from the Commission to do the design of this new solution based entirely on the MFF, because we will not have this. 
that that's that's the thing I, I would not, not like to see in the in the in the in the conclusions of the hour work. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, uh, Lucas, and Olalia for uh, helping us uh, understanding better what to expect from the from the ongoing uh, Eurogroup or the Eurogroup that will uh, continue tomorrow, and also from the upcoming uh, European Council. We see that. Uh, there are some uh, economic uh, solution there, but as always, we need also to find the right political means to, to sell them to their to each country's uh, constituency and that's also part of the, of the negotiation. Um, I won't draw any further conclusions from, from our side, but just to, to wrap up, uh, I'd like also to thank you, uh, all our um, 80 participants uh, who took part and for, their, for addressing us uh, their, their questions. Uh, we will uh, continue this uh, webinar, as I said, uh, uh, next week, uh, this time we will uh, address uh, more precisely the, the issue of uh, the unemployment scheme that the Commission has put on the table and the way to, to address it. Uh, I would like to, to specify that this webinar will be uh, this time in French, uh, uh, but you are all very welcome, uh, certainly. And uh, we will also uh, have a press conference uh, with our President Enrico Letta uh, before the European Council as soon as the date is, is scheduled also to, to share our thoughts and, and take your questions on this. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you once again on this uh, webinar, which is uh, the best way to keep ties while we're all uh, having to stay at home. And uh, from there, I will uh, leave you as, since it's 3.30 sharp, we started at 2.30 sharp, so I think we, uh, unlike the year ago that last 16 hours, we managed to, 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 to do many things in just one hour. Thank you very much again and see you next week.